This is day two of reading Revelation. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write this, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the seven gold lampstands says this, I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate the wicked. You have tested those who call themselves apostles but are not, and discovered that they are impostors. Moreover, you have endurance and have suffered for my name, and you have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have lost the love you had at first. Realize how far you have fallen. Repent, and do the works you did at first. Otherwise I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But you have this in your favor. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the victor I will give the right to eat from the tree of life that is in the garden of God. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write this. The first and the last, who once died but came to life, says this. I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who claim to be Jews and are not, but rather are members of the assembly of Satan. Do not be afraid of anything that you are going to suffer. Indeed, the devil will throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will face an ordeal for ten days. Remain faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The victor shall not be harmed by the second death. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write this. The one with the sharp two-edged sword says this. I know that you live where Satan's throne is, and yet you hold fast to my name and have not denied your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was martyred among you, where Satan lives. Yet I have a few things against you. You have some people there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who instruct Balak to put a stumbling block before the Israelites, to eat food sacrificed to idols and to play the harlot, Likewise, you have some people who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. Otherwise, I will come to you quickly and wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the victor, I shall give some of the hidden manna. I, al I shall also give a white amulet upon which is inscribed a new name, which no one knows except the one who receives it. Today we begin the messages to the churches. Here I must repeat my earlier warning that much of what we read is to some degree contextual. It's, it's sealed in history. These messages were written to specific people at a specific time far in the past. And so we can't necessarily know exactly what their circumstances were. And we shouldn't necessarily put ourselves directly in their position necessarily. That said, as is the case with much of what is in the Bible, there are always larger points and points that transcend time that are worth our consideration. Two that I think are particularly important as we read these messages to the churches are the message of the need for faithfulness. They were under pressure, the pressure of uh, persecution. We are likewise under pressure, the pressure of indifference, the pressure of a culture that is increasingly secularizing. And so the idea that the church should remain faithful even in the face of opposition of one kind or another is an important message. And there's also uh, the making of good use of resources. Uh, in a couple of cases, we'll hear that a church is rich or that it's poor and that it may or may not be doing the best that it can with the resources that it has been given. One other point I should make as we read through these, that there's this reference to the Nicolaitans. It's worth mentioning just briefly that we don't exactly know who they were. They may have been heretics. It's not clear exactly what their beliefs or practices were that were considered to be heretical. <clears throat> uh, so we don't really know. And and you could easily take out Nicolaitans and stick in all sorts of other words that were current then or that are current now. So there is a bigger point here, which is that we should search our own souls a little bit 
to ask why it is that we feel we always have to have opponents. Why is it that there always has to be a them in order for us to be uh, coherent and holding together and thinking well of ourselves. Perhaps sometimes we create opposition where it really isn't needed. And certainly now, 2,000 years later, we hear of this dispute between factions in the church and the significance of it is completely lost on us. What comes down to us still is the idea of being faithful to the message of God. So the value of unity and common purpose should not be overlooked here. With that said, we can turn to what uh, the angel says to the church at Ephesus. They are told that they've lost the love that they had. So this, again, is a reminder of purpose. Perhaps they're doing what they're supposed to do, but they're doing it grimly. I mean, how much love is there in grim assistance to people, grudging help, coldness when in the presence of other people? So we're, we're being told that there's something about the way we do it that is just as important as what we do. Certainly in God's economy, which is my ongoing theme through this series, everything is motivated and should be motivated by grace. And grace is the, the, the currency of heaven, the currency of the kingdom of God. This should give us a little pause when we hear about the church at Smyrna, which is described as being poor and yet being rich. Presumably what it is rich in is the grace and inspiration of God that enables it to do much with even limited resources. And that should be a message that rings down the ages even to us as we live in a time when it seems that the power and wealth of Christianity as a movement in, the, in society more broadly is receding. And then we wind it all up with this statement that recurs in one form or another after every one of the messages to the churches. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. We are wise always to remember that the Spirit is speaking to us. The Spirit will not cease to speak to us. Whether we're able to hear what the Spirit says, whether we're able to listen to what the Spirit says, and whether we're able to heed those messages is perhaps another question. But we are being reminded that if we will listen, if we will pay attention to what it is that God is saying, what it is that God desires, we will discover much about what we can be doing, what we should be doing to serve the kingdom of God. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,